We are at part nine. How to live life to the fullest. We want to be able to live life ourselves so that not only is life a better quality in all realms, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, financially, and so on and so forth, but Christ came not just to save us, but so that we can live life abundantly now today and to be guides and shepherds to the community so they can experience what we already realize we can experience and are even experiencing a taste of today. So that's the purpose of this series. We've been going through all these points together. So now let us pause for a special prayer over this moment, our sermon. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you for the peace and safety and this proximity and for answering our prayer and being in our midst. So we just right now just acknowledge we still, we're still ready and willing and give you permission to touch our hearts, not by me, but by you speaking through me and, and speaking through all of us as we in turn hear clearly this message so we can share it to others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, part nine, we need to talk about how an advocate, comforter, and counselor plays into this picture. And it, it really is best understood talking about Dallas. Now, not Dallas, Texas, of course, although that's, I'm sure that's a great city. I've never been there myself, but Dallas, the barber, she began life like any girl, naive, naive to the world with a family that loved her but then experienced trauma and tragedy in her life at a young age. And as she dealt with that tragedy and that the abandonment in her life, the naivety eventually gave way to a toughness, to a thick skin. I mean, she was so naive at first as she's walking down the street, someone tried to offer to sell her some drugs. You want to buy some rock? And she just laughed, like, why would I want to buy gravel? I mean, that's how naive she was until just to fit in, she realized a secret in her life, and that was to be tough. So she set in on being as tough as possible and got in with the tough crowd, and she was the toughest in her crowd. As she got older, got into high school, she wasn't popular. She was looked at. She wasn't accepted. She felt abandoned by her classmates and got in a fight in the classroom and tore them up. I mean, kids got hurt. She blacked out and fought and won and made her mark not to mess with Dallas. This was a tough girl. And that began her life just getting tougher and acting out, trying to self-soothe her trauma and, and, and the wreckage in her life. Some of it caused by her own actions, just trying to live life the only way she knew how, yet it wasn't at the fullest potential she was destined to experience. So here's Dallas at 16 now, in the throes of trying to deal socially, and her family's broken. She's abandoned by her mom to live with her dad and other siblings, and, and it's just a mess, and so she's acting out even more, and it just, any of you with teenagers, or had teenagers, you know, they, they're, it's an awkward time, but she was just, she was on this other level, and her acting out, and her dad would play the, I'm going to send you back, send you to your mom card. He, he'd use that as a ploy to get her to, to keep in line and to quit acting out, but Dallas wouldn't have it. She didn't care. Fine, go ahead. I don't know her from Adam. She hasn't been in my life that much in the past, but whatever. Well, finally, after her acting out, got to a level he could no longer stand, that was it. Blowed her up in the car, drove her all the way to her mom's house in Spokane. Abandoned her. So now here she is, Dallas, about 16 abandoned by her dad, already abandoned by her mom, to live with her mom, who in her mind was the root cause of all this initial abandonment and, and, and the difficulty she was having experiencing life to the fullest. So what do you think she did? How do you think she managed? 
Did that straighten her out? Did she get an attitude adjustment? No. Dallas kept doing things the way she knew how to do because she was tough. She could handle herself. She was a fighter. She was scrappy. She did what she needed to do to fit in, and she fit in with the guys. She was that tough. Fast forward a few years as she continues to behave this way, starts to become addicted to self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, and she's 19. She had a party. She doesn't remember much of it. She blacked out. She blacked out often when she drank. That's a sign of trouble. When she came to, when she realized what was happening, she's coming to a clarity of mind in jail with a broken wrist. She begins to piece together what happened. Did I really drive? Her friends eventually fill her in on the story and her cloudy mind begins to piece it together. She got into her pickup truck. Now she, she's a tough girl, so she has a typical Washington pickup truck or, or a Dallas, Texas pickup truck. I'm from Virginia. Over there, we raise things up. Here in Southern California, you lower everything, right? You got to lower it, slam it. Well, her truck was slammed. It was rigged up. Big wheels, two bucket seats, a big subwoofer in the middle. I mean, you were only supposed to fit, to fit two people in it. But she left that party wasted with her friends. They let her drive filled that cab up with people, and she goes down the road and slams through a wrought iron fence right into the Catholic high school. That's Dallas, just crashing in to your life. And there she is in jail, realizing something's got to change. Her dad bails her out, and as soon as she could, she goes to see the wreckage. She's already got a wrecked life, now she's got a wrecked truck, and the windshield's got spider webs in it. They could have all gone through it and been decapitated. They could have all died. Praise the Lord, no one died. And that's what she actually said. She was so taken back, she got serious with her life at this point. Court ordered AA. She was serious. She never touched a drink until she was 21. She did her best to live life to the fullest, the only way she knew how, but she was still tough. Living life her own way. And she had some seeds planted. Last week we talked about, you know, tilling the soil of our lives, and we, we help till the soil, and until the soil is ready, seeds that get scattered, they don't take root, but eventually some do, and sometimes they die out, and you got to keep working at it, and there's this long period of time until the seeds really start to thrive and you're ready to make the transition to a full commitment to Christ and baptism and growth and all of that discipleship stuff. So she's still over here in this tilled soil that's really rocky. It's a tough soil. Nothing's taken root, but there's some seeds there. Occasionally something springs to life and it dies out. This is where she is from age 19 to about 21. And that cracked windshield and the fact that she was forgiven from that incident. I mean, she should have owed thousands of dollars to that Catholic high school and the church. But they let her off because they wanted to see her get well rather than repay her debt. And she didn't take that for granted either, so she did her best. She was trying to get her life back in order, going through the steps, going to rehab, decided to check out the church that she knew the one she kind of grew up in. So she started attending. She was reading her Bible a bit. She was getting excited because there was a place she thought she could fit in. She loved worship. She had a good voice. Dallas wanted to participate anywhere, but she's humble. Seeds are starting to take root. She's excited now. She's ready. She's ready. She did it. She responded and set up an appointment with just the right pastor. She gets in the office. She sits down. Just, just ready. She unloads. This is where I'm at. Where can I help? I want to transform my life. I know God can do it. Where, where can I help here? I worship. Anywhere. I'll clean toilets. I just want to be a part of something. I want to be accepted. And as you know, I mean, this, this is the greatest 
thing a pastor or any church leader would love to hear, right? The generation that's leaving the church and never even joined it is sitting right there ready for action. Lead me, here I am. The pastor responds. Well, why don't, why don't you just hang out some more and we'll see how it goes. And that cut like a knife. She's abandoned by her mom, abandoned by her dad, and now abandoned by God, at least the face of God, the pastor of the church. So you know what she does? Well, yeah, you know what she does, what she always does, what she knows how to do. Her toughness comes out, that's it. And she continues to run for another nine years after that experience. The seeds have withered up now because there's still more work to do in the soil of her heart because Dallas is a wrecked individual, broken. And all of the people that typically would be there to guide and help her to a path of fullness and to Christ are not there. She's got a skewed, jaded picture of family, of men. She was being abused at home physically and other abuse in her life. And men, as I've already preached about before, tend to be not just a father figure, a God figure for all of us growing up. And so she's got a skewed picture of God, the church, and family, and friends. And she's running. She's struggling. She's doing her best. But you know what happens with that mindset my way or the highway and being tough being an addict and with all this trauma with no hope and no way to figure out how to make something good out of this bad situation she's on a spiral decline it's one blackout after another one failed rehab attempt after another leaving a wreckage in her pathway of relationships until she meets Matt, gets married, and he's a good husband, and then they have a child, and he's a great father. He's supportive. He doesn't quite understand the God thing, but he's there for her. She's starting to get grounded now. And you know what happened to some of those seeds? Because of some of the tilling that had happened years ago, over 10 years ago, at this point in Dallas's life, to begin to take root. She's had enough. She's broken enough now. Her attention is ready for anything. Help me, essentially. So she pulls out her Bible. She opens up her phone and begins to tweak her playlist to praise music, which she always loves. Soft spot for praise music, the word, and begins to do this for a few years, longer, until finally something dramatic changes in her life. She gets reconnected with her sister Shelby. Broken relationship because Dallas has made a wreckage out of every relationship, including her own siblings. But they're starting to get close now, and Shelby called her up and said, Dallas, can you, you've got to come to worship. You've got to, I'm going to be preaching for the first time. You see, her sister Shelby, had her path was completely different with the way she handled the wreckage and trauma in her life. Dallas suffered, suffers still today from anxiety, overwhelmed with her past and grappling with guilt and regrets and shame, particularly at that point in her life. But it's her sister. She's going to be preaching for the first I've got to be there. But immediately... The anxiety wells up inside her and she's thinking of an excuse. Well, I got a kid. I can't do that. I'm too busy. They won't accept me. I'm too tough. They're, they're going to be looking at me. She couldn't think of an excuse, but she'd been reading the Bible, trying to reconnect with God. So she gives in. Okay, I'll be there. I'll be there. Oh, Shelby was so happy. But you know what Dallas is doing now between then and that preaching moment was just thinking about it, ruminating on it. Oh, it was tearing her up inside. But then she was praying, if this, if this is what you want, right down to her drive to church, 
to hear her sister. She was trying to find every excuse in her mind to back out. She prayed one of those Gideon prayers. God, if this is really what you want, you need to show me a sign. Isn't that what Gideon prayed? You had to show me a sign. It needs to be a special sign that you want me there. That this is a sign that you want me, there's a place for me that you accept me, that you can make my life new. The church used to preach that message, but they rejected me. The Bible seems to suggest the message. Is it true? Show me. So with that kind of prayer, Dallas enters that worship center with her husband Matt and young son. But she had it all planned out now. She knew exactly what to do. She'd been there before. She knew it was big. Lots of people, lots of high anxiety, lots of eyes. But she would just go straight to the children's center, drop off her kid, and then go early and get down to the front row or second row so everyone's behind. She can just focus on her sister, focus on God, focus on herself and that worship experience. And it worked. She's there. She sat down. Matt's there. He doesn't know what's going on, but he's there with her. He's supportive. Everything's in place. Then the worship music starts, and this is the moment she begins to allow the Spirit to do its work. She recalls, she remembered it, but it had been so long, and she was overjoyed sensing the Holy Spirit move on her heart through worship, through song, through prayer. She's having a great time reconnecting. Sits down, announcements, and then the typical thing. She was dreading it. She knew it was coming. They hadn't changed their worship order of service in years. Still the same. So she knew the next thing. All right, everyone. You've probably, this caught, we've called memories. Stand up and greet your neighbor. Oh, she hated that. Just more anxiety. Most people probably hate that, but we, we put on the happy face. Shake hands. Uh, what did you have for breakfast? Share with your neighbor. You know, some icebreaker. Okay, now sit down. All right. We're, so she was just dreading that, and sure enough, stand up. And oh, So she's dodging people's eyes. She's trying to look distracted so she doesn't seem rude, that she doesn't want to shake hands. And she's like, okay, it's almost over. I've, uh, I've finally gotten through this experience. And there's a tap on her shoulder. Uh Uh-oh. And she, in her mind, she's thinking, okay, someone's telling me I shouldn't be here. What's going on? And it's this really nice lady. And she's like, are you Dallas? Now, Dallas is a tough girl. She's been used to rejection and abandonment all her life, so you know what she does? She gets defensive. Yeah? You you know my mom? You must know my sister. No, I don't know my mom. But you're Dallas, aren't you? Yeah? Can I talk to you after the service? Oh, uh, sure. But in her mind, she's like, no, I don't want to do that. Why, why did I say yes? And her husband, Matt's like, you know, sure, yeah. So, okay, by then it's time for the next part of the service. So she sits down. You know what she's doing for the next 45 minutes? Waiting for Shelby to come on? She's plotting her escape. She's trying to run. Okay, I'll drop... But we'll go pick up my son and I'll, I'll go out to the car and just run away. Just stand her up. So after, she didn't even remember what her sister preached. She was so anxiety ridden over how to handle this crucial conversation. And in her mind, you know, what did I do to this lady? <laughs> did I beat her up in a bar some time ago? Did I beat up one of her kids? Did, did I do something to offend her? Is she just... This is it. This is God telling me through her, I don't belong here and to get out. So she's thinking all this for 45 minutes. Service is over. She's ready. She's going to dodge to the children's center. You know what her husband Matt does? Hey, honey, I'll go get our son. You can talk to this lady. Oh. So the lady pulls her aside and says, Dallas, I got to tell you something. I don't live here. I live six hours away in Seattle. I was driving home. You see, I, as a believer, I listen to the Holy Spirit. I pray for the Spirit. I, I say, Spirit, move me. I'm at your service today. And so I'm driving home, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and I just had this 
this impression I needed to stop and take the next exit, so I did. Then I found a hotel, and I had this impression to keep praying, what is it, Lord? And I had an impression to find a church service to go to, and so here I am. So I kept praying, Lord, what is it you want me to do? I'm here. And Dallas, when you stood up and started singing with the congregation, I heard your voice, and I recognized your voice, Dallas. I recognize you. I recognize the sound of your voice from years ago. It was like 10 years prior. You were singing at a women's conference. And back then, I started praying for you, and I'd pray for you every so often. I never stopped praying for you, Dallas. And I'm here to tell you, Dallas, today, God sent me here today to tell you, Dallas, that he still wants your voice. You don't look anything like you did back then, but your voice is the same. He may not be using it the same as he did then, but he's going to use your voice in a new and creative way or any way if you will just let him. If you will just let, do you get it? God answered Dallas's prayer in a special way for her because she needed it right then. Everyone in her life, many people had abandoned her. But God showed up that day through this lady. Dallas, you still have a voice. You are accepted. Just accept his invitation. And see, that experience of Dallas reminds me exactly of the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, and the counselor. So turn with me to John chapter 14. Let's review our scripture here at verse 12. Because this really encapsulates exactly what Dallas was going through and how she found relief, how she began a journey. You're going to hear the rest of the story in a minute. John chapter 14, verse 12. The screen's up. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. And whatever, anything, nothing too big, nothing too small. If it glorifies God, basically, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will. He's reiterating this in this passage. Jesus is speaking. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another, a helper, that he may abide with you forever. So this experience here is related to what the disciples were going through. Very similar to what Dallas was going through her whole life up to that point. And the lady tapped on her shoulder, are you Dallas? I know your voice. You have a voice for the Lord. The See, do you recall where this passage is in the saga of Jesus Christ's ministry to each of us? The disciples are in the upper room. They're getting ready to have to deal with serious abandonment issues. It's just hours away from Christ's crucifixion. Peter is already freaked out and started talking about getting baths and things. Judas Iscariot has already left, seeking to work out his will politically and turning Jesus over to the authorities, hoping that this will overthrow the government and the religious system or whatever he was thinking. Thomas is already doubting the way. What is this way you're talking about? Timothy, he's, he's a little confused as well, too. He needs some help. So Jesus begins this chapter, or we see in this chapter, Jesus saying, after he tells him, I'm not going to be here, but then you'll see me. I'll be gone. And you'll... So don't worry. There's plenty of rooms where I'm going. 
You can't go there now, but eventually. So don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Right? He's giving them the comfort they need at this time. He's trying to explain what's going to happen in his absence so they don't have abandonment issues, so they don't act out and have to be the tough guys. Same experience Dallas was going through. Abandoned my mom and dad and classmates and the world and the church and the, and the face of the church and God, the pastor, and, and just on and on. And This helper here in verse 16, he will give you another helper. And then jo John goes on in this chapter, in chapter 16, and in his first epistle, to talk about the helper. Now, this is an interesting word. We need to go into this for a minute, so don't glaze over on your eyes. Keep, keep paying attention. This is special. You know, John is just a unique writer. I mean, Paul's unique. They're all unique, but John is just superb in his relational connection with Christ and, and translating that for all of us. So we get a picture of Jesus and the Trinity their total nature. And so this word for helper is parakletos. And the transliterated into English is paraklete. And para is a preposition that means beside, and, and kletos is the one called, the one summoned to be by your side. Is The literal translation is the one called to be by your side. The one called to be by your side. And I will pray the Father and he will give you someone to come by your side that he may abide with you forever. But you see, this is, this is what's so awesome about John. He's the only one in the whole Bible that uses this Greek word. Now you might recall that the Greek that they're writing in and speaking is, is street Greek. It's just common Greek. It's not academic Greek. It's not the Greek of today. This, this is... Street Greek of then. And because John's the only one to use this form of this word, it's really tough for the translators all throughout the time of translating what we have of the Greek manuscripts that were copied. It's been tough. But each year we find more relics. We find more contemporary pieces of literature from that language during the time John was writing where they use various words and we can see how they're used in context and compare that to how the street Greek of the Bible is used in context and piece together and learn the language better. And what we're seeing, if you do a quick study this afternoon and get your lexicon out and your concordance and do all that, you're going to see that some translators translate it, helper, it's the New King James, comforter, Counselor, advocate. And then they argue, oh, no, it should be advocate. Because in 1 John 2, 1, if you sin, that's okay. You have an advocate, right? You have someone to represent you because of your sin. Well, that's, that, that's true. That's a sense of this. But then counselor and comforter and helper and friend all fit as well. And if you spend the rest of the afternoon exploring the rest of John's gospel, and you will see that John's actually speaking of all these senses, but there isn't one word in English that does justice. So there's some translations that don't even translate it into English. They just leave it paraclete because there's no English equivalent. But for simplicity, this is what John is teaching us. That God will never abandon you. He would never abandon Dallas. He will never abandon you. And to prove his point and to help you along the way, he has sent you an advocate, a friend, to be by your side, to comfort you. It's okay. I'll help you out. I'll bail you out of jail. You can work here. I'm patient with you. You're rebounding again. That's okay. I'm here for you. And then as you comfort, you know, and you're there, you're, you're, and nope, let her off. I can imagine that church, that, that business meeting that happened, whether or not to let her off when she crashed through their school, right? 
Someone was an advocate for her. Let her go. Forgive her. Just as Jesus did on the cross, our advocate. But he promised to send the comforter and friend and counselor. And once, you know, once you're, you're more likely to accept the counsel of someone who's provided comfort, aren't you? Right? Dallas needed all of that in her life. The disciples did as well. He said, don't worry. You're, you're going to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be in my place as your advocate, as your counselor, as your comforter, as your friend, your parakletos. John is saying to each of us, the disciples' experience is so similar to Dallas. But they didn't lash out. They, they accepted it. Eventually, they understood the, the role of the Holy Spirit in that upper room with the tongues of fire on Pentecost that empowered them to be tough guys and gals in the Lord because it was a mixed crowd. It wasn't segregated. Doing Jesus' way of ministry. And so this comforter, this counselor, this advocate in Dallas' life, the Holy Spirit answered her prayer and sent a comforter. And this is how it works. Because it says here, let me just back up. Most assuredly, verse 12, I say to you, who, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And then he goes on to talk about the works that he does, sending the advocate, the comforter, and the counselor. So the works that Jesus does, the Spirit does, and what the Spirit does, you and I are called to do too. Amen? And that lady that touched Dallas' shoulder was working as an ambassador for the Holy Spirit, doing the work of God, telling Dallas, God loves you, you're called, your voice needs to be heard, Spiritually especially, you have a place. Well, that's not the rest of the story for Dallas. And I shout out to Justin Koo. You might he's preached here before, I'm sure. Dr. Nathan Koo's son. He's he's a in ministry. He does ministry podcasting and and YouTubing. And he, right now he's doing an awesome thing, interviewing just people. Just getting to know them, having a conversation about what makes them tick, how they get along in life. And, and no doubt things come out in that conversation. And so he shared Dallas' story. And, and Dr. Koo said, Pastor, he messaged me, can I post this? And I watched it. I said, sure. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Dr. Koo. Because, and it's going to be posted on our Facebook. You can go watch this video interview and learn more about Dallas transformation she did she changed her life because this is what happened so this lady's telling her you've got a voice there's still a place for you god's accepting you your past is the past she real she she could just let it go she weeps she's cut to the heart in a good way now probably the first time in her life couldn't even recall what was preached that day but god spoke to her anyway through the helper the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, this lady, and that's your role in the church. That's your role as a friend. That's, this is our role as well. The Spirit works through us to help be this type of person for the Dallases of this world, in our lives, in the community. So Dallas had to make a choice, and this is key. She's got the helper. It's right there, working through this lady, the voice of God through this lady who's gifted, in hearing God's word, sensing his work. She accepted the call. The lady did. Now Dallas needs to do something. What? She needs to say, yes, I accept God. And she did. She, did. she realized this was a special, unique to her message from God. And she said yes. And never looked back. Never. And incidentally, this was the right time. Her, the soil was now tended. The seeds are planted. This was the right time because she had now been sober for several years. She and her husband had started a barber shop, of all things. So she's Dallas the barber. And what she does now is so unique and awesome. And you can watch a 
video clip on our Facebook page, which will send you to Justin's YouTube page and learn all about how she has used her voice to be an instrument for the Lord because now her life is transformed. She's victorious. She's made it. She's living life to the fullest, her family and her staff, because she says now, when you come to her barber shop, the haircuts are free, but the conversation, comedy, and therapy is what you pay for. See, the haircut only lasts for 30 days, but while they're in there, you know, you're talking. You know how it is at the salon, those of you that go to the salon and the bar, right? Some of you are doing these home haircuts now, but when you go back out into the world, there's lots of talking, right? You can go deep. You get to know people, right? You, you open up with your barber or your hairstylist, right? And actually, what she does with her staff is they, you can tell they're trained to lead the conversations to get to know them. And so now they've got a whole system. They've got someone on staff 40 hours a week offering therapy and guidance in a very subtle way. Like, hey, let's go talk. I see you're crying. Are you... One guy came in smelling so terrible, living on the streets for so long, clothes stuck to him. They just, oh, no problem. They open up the windows, light some candles, services, haircut needs. And he left with brand new clothes. The pastor comes from the church to pray with him because they've got a hotline to the church pastor and the ministry team. Do you need a bed? Do you need a church family? Do you need money? What is it you need? And he was so touched. After the prayer, he said, I just, I just want to go home. So they sent him home. States, states. Can you imagine the joy of his parents when their prodigal son is home? Because this prodigal daughter of God, Dallas, has been home now and is working using her voice as an advocate, as a counselor, and as a comforter. Transformed by Jesus through the guiding hand of the advocates and counselors and comforters in her life through the church and that lady, and that is your role today. So you might connect with Dow's story. And I know some of you do because you've had wreckage. You're bro you've been broken, but you now are victorious in Christ because you accepted the help. You asked for help as Dallas did. It came, you accepted it, and you're transformed because of it. So you connect with Dallas' story. Others of you connect because you sense the advocate and counselor and comforters in your life speaking to you. They've been speaking to you. The Spirit's been working through you, to you directly and through these people to encourage you to take that leap of faith and commit and accept the help to live life to the fullest in all realms. And you're, you're ready to say yes today. So you're, you're like, I, I, I am right there. I want to say yes like Dallas. And then there's others that connect with this because you're, you're, you're advanced in your spiritual growth and you are ready to be the advocate and comforter and counselor to those around you in a more powerful way like transforming your place of business into a ministry resource center or your neighborhood or your backyard, wherever. You're just ready to accept that. So with every head bowed and eyes closed, I'd like to pray for your commitment to this. Father in heaven, we thank you for transforming our lives, Dallas's life, and bringing each comforter, counselor, and advocate into our lives that helped lead us to you. So we can be here together. That those we're thinking of now that need transformation, we can be an instrument, an advocate for them, a helper, a comforter to be by their side. We, we think of these experiences. And so today, you, friends at home and here, every eye closed and head bowed, and Father God, you see these hands as I'm calling. If, if you'd like to accept the call of the Holy Spirit, the comforter in your life, calling you to receive this help that you sense from Scripture reading, from the guidance, of those wise people in your life and you just haven't accepted just yet, but you want to now to make a difference in your life, to make a change. You're just tired of the past. You want to come to Jesus, figure out what this is all about or get to know him better. Would you just raise your hand just now so I can see your hands? Amen. You see these hands, Father. Now I ask, 
those that want to be a comforter and helper, counselor to others, to accept that call to help others be led to Jesus, to the comforter, the advocate, and counselor. If you want to do that in a mighty way, in a new way, or just courage and strength to keep doing it, would you just raise your hand just now so I can see your hand and God knows as well. Amen. Father, collectively, we need this advocate in our life, our counselor, our friend, our comforter. You've seen these requests for help and courage and transformation. Continue to transform all of us, whether it's a new beginning, continued journey, and in leading others to the cross. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.